Hi, I'm Dr. Alicia Pawanda Winburn of the University of West Florida, and I'm a forensic anthropologist. Now, what that means is that I'm an expert in human skeletal variation, and I use that expertise to answer questions of medico-legal significance. Typically, who somebody was and how they died. So as you can see, I've just accessioned a case, so I'm going to get to work. Now, my first job is to figure out who this person was. And in order to do that, I have to narrow down the universe of possible missing persons who could match this individual. To do that, I use what's called the biological profile. It's basically just a skeletal snapshot of who that person was during their life. And it includes variables like their age at death, their stature, how tall they were, their biological sex, and their ancestry. With each step of the biological profile, we get a little bit closer to narrowing that universe of possible matching missing persons till we finally get down to a more manageable pool that we can actually make an ID with. Today we're going to focus on ancestry. Now, ancestry is our proxy for race. Race is, of course, a social category, but we can approximate it by looking at rough clusters of biological traits that cluster in people from different geographic regions. Craniometrics, for example, or head measurements, track with genetic data, and certain traits called macromorphoscopics, things like uh, the breadth or width of the nasal aperture, can reflect the ancestral climate in which a person's ancestors evolved. So, in order to do craniometry, Craniometry means head measuring. So we have to take standardized measurements of the human cranium. To do that, we use standardized tools. Things like a spreading or a sliding calipers. We'd use a spreading calipers to capture larger measurements, such as the cranial length or breadth, and we'd use a sliding calipers to capture finer grained data, like for example, the breadth or height of the nasal aperture. We would then take those standardized measurements and input them into a computer program that would compare them statistically with the same measurements taken in identified decedents from known populations around the globe. If I were to take a macromorphoscopic approach, I might focus on traits of the face, things that have functional evolutionary significance, like the shape of the nose, which has been correlated with the climate in the environment in which one's ancestors evolved. So I might look at the breadth of the nose, I might look at how far apart the eyes are, and then I would look up the frequencies at which those different trait expressions occur in different ancestral populations. So by understanding human skeletal variation at a global level, and then overlying that understanding of the clinal or continuous nature of that variation on a population like the United States that is structured in terms of social race, forensic anthropologists can check the right box for a particular skeletal decedent. The question remains, should we? For one thing, the minor skeletal variants that we observe among members of different geographic populations are meaningless in terms of the stuff that actually counts about being human. So nose shape may have been one thing in the ancestral environment, but it doesn't say anything about one's intelligence or strength or creativity or capacity to learn and teach and innovate. All of that really good stuff belongs to all human populations as part of our human ancestral heritage. And so if forensic anthropologists are assigning decedents to racial categories based on these minor biological variants, we have to understand that we may be giving people the impression that there are other major biological variants among human populations, things that just don't exist. For another thing, forensic anthropologists understand that when we estimate ancestry, we are overlying our knowledge of continuous human variation on particular social structures that are human-made, things like racial categories. But when we do so, we run the risk of reifying race, 
of reinforcing the validity of race as a biological descriptor of our species. And it simply isn't. Categorical social races just are not the best descriptor of continuous human biological variation. However, they are intensely socially meaningful. And just because race is a social construct doesn't mean that race and racism don't exist. In fact, the chronic stress of experiencing racism, both at a systemic and an individual level, can detrimentally impact the biological well-being of the people that experience it. And so the social can actually become biological when it is embodied, physically incorporated into the bodies of people of color in a United States where social inequalities are maintained. Forensic anthropologists need to ask ourselves, what are we contributing with ancestry estimates? Should we even be engaging with social race categories at all? For those who say yes, it's all about the identification. Any information that gets us closer to narrowing that pool of missing unknown decedents is good information. Others say the information that comes from an ancestry estimate doesn't actually get us very far in terms of an ID. And still others fear that estimating ancestry in a member of a marginalized population might actually hinder their identification if inequalities in the U.S. criminal justice system are reproduced in the U.S. medical legal system. The debate continues, and I don't have the answers. Rather than pretend that I do, I want to linger on this note of discomfort. Forensic anthropology has a race problem. Further, almost 90% of our practitioners identify as white. This has to change. We have to take active steps to ensure that this changes. Because as the face of our field changes, then the things that we value as a field will also change. Our methods and the research questions that we ask will change. And yes, our approaches to race and ancestry will change, hopefully for the better.